That was kind of strange. All right. So last time we were talking about circuit analysis algorithms, I surveyed a whole bunch of different running times that are known for uh, different kinds of analysis problems for circuits. And now I'll talk more about uh, the circuit complexity side of things today. So I'll, I'll try to go a bit slower um, than just, just an overview of a bunch of different bounds and some ideas behind them. I'll, I'll try to just give you at least a reminder, a crash course of, of circuit complexity. And, um, and I'll also get to connections between these two. Uh, in other words, when you know, mixing blue and red, we get purple. Okay. Um, so, all right, let's get started. So the way we've been looking at circuits is there are finite objects that take a finite number of inputs and output a bit. And it's natural to ask, like, well, can you use circuits to compute infinite languages? Okay, like problems of the usual kind that are solved via algorithms or Turing machines. And so this is done in the following way. We allow a distinct logical circuit called A sub n to be run on inputs of length n. Okay, so you imagine an infinite sequence of circuits, one for each input length. Okay, so one for inputs of length 100, one for inputs of length 10,000, and so on. And when I get an input of a certain length, you know, imagine just feeding it to you know, a certain length n, I feed it to a sub n, and it gives me the answer. Okay, and in this way I can talk about a circuit, an infinite circuit family computing an infinite language. Okay, and so the, the notion of feasible computation in this kind of uh, non-uniform model, non-uniform in contrast to the uniform model where you have a single algorithm that works on all inputs no matter how long they are, in this non-uniform model, feasibility uh, corresponds to this class P poly, which is a class of problems solvable with a circuit family, infinite family of these circuits, A sub n, so that there exists a fixed polynomial, or you can think of it as a constant k, so that for all n, the size of the nth circuit in terms of the number of gates, say, is at most into the k. All right? So, um, so I might have an infinite number of different programs, a different program run for each input length, but for any fixed input length, the program is of size at most polynomial in the input length. Okay? So here I'm, I'm studying how the size of the computation scales with the input. And I'm not saying here's a specific algorithm that's going to run on everything. I'm really, I really want to study, you know, as input lengths grow, what does it do to the relative size of computation required? Okay. So in this model, so here's just a few important points. In this model, programs have infinite length descriptions. Okay. Like just writing down the program, you have to write down one for each input length. And so you can get some funny uh, counterintuitive results. So, for example, one problem which is uh, well known to be undecidable is to uh, take the, uh, the subset of one star where I put the string of n ones if and only if the nth string machine under some enumeration halts on blank tape. Okay, this problem is undecidable. Okay, it's not too hard to see why. I mean, if you wrote the nth string machine in binary, this is more or less follows from Rice's theorem, things like that. Okay. But, uh, but you can you know, just reduce it to this problem. And so this problem is undecidable. Nevertheless, it is in P poly. Okay? And the reason why it's in P poly is that for every input length n, there's two possibilities for the function restricted to n bit inputs. It's either all zeros, it either accepts nothing, or it accepts the string of n ones. Okay, so, so for example, if the first string machine halted on blank tape, my first circuit would just be, you know, take the and of all the, the inputs. So, well, here it's just x1, so I'll just output 1. But like uh, with m sub n, if it halts, then I'll just take uh, the and of n1s. If it, if it didn't halt on blank tape, then I could just take instead the circuit, let's say x1, not x1, so this circuit always output zero, no matter what input you give it. So for every single input length, I, could, I will either put this circuit in there or this circuit in there, both are polynomial size, so the thing is in p-poly. Okay? So um, I guess the main point about this is that if you use a reduction, like an 
to prove undecidability, and you spread out the undecidability among many, many input links, then in fact you get feasibility here. And so the usual techniques in computability theory are just more or less powerless for trying to understand what is computable with polynomial size circuits and what is not. Okay? Okay, is there any questions about, about that? Right. Right, so, so I want to talk about, in contrast to circuit analysis algorithms, which I, which I was calling algorithms for circuits, I want to talk about circuits for algorithms. Okay, this is a different kind of problem. This is a problem rooted in circuit complexity, whereas the algorithms for circuits problem is about circuit analysis algorithms. So again, this is p-poly. So in the circuits for algorithms problem, we're trying to understand what kinds of languages have small circuits and which don't. Okay? Most Boolean functions require huge circuits. I think Russell mentioned this in his talk. For example, if you just uh, randomly chose a function by just picking a uniform random 2 to the n bit string, this will require a circuit of size at least 2 to the n over n with high probability. Okay? So most functions require huge circuits. Can we get our hands on particular interesting functions that require huge circuits? So the circuits for algorithms question ask what uniform algorithms can be simulated in p-poly? Okay? So what problems in the uniform world can be simulated in p-poly? Like, for example, p, polynomial time, can be simulated in p-poly, as we know. But uh, it's, it's really hard to show that uh, functions computable even sort of weakly uniformly are not in p-poly. So, for example, you could ask, can huge uniform classes like maybe p-space, polynomial space, or exponential time, or non-deterministic exponential time, can they be simulated with small non-uniform classes like p-poly? Okay? Uh, you would think, you know, the answer to such a question is just obviously no, that like uh, allowing yourself exponential time, uh, just because you spread, you know, you allow a different circuit for each input link, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like that would help you, that like certain, that like all of a sudden if I get to design a separate computer for each input link, exponential time becomes polynomial, exponential is just too big. Um, but we, the thing is we just really don't know how to reason about these infinite models. The key obstacle is that non-uniformity can be very, very powerful. Okay. And the best example of this I know is, is this very simple example that undecidable problems can be in p-poly. Okay. So, I mean, um, yeah, so you're never going to have, for example, p-poly contained in any of these things. Okay. Uh, just because it has some undecidable things in it. Right? So, so one big open problem uh, is whether nx is in p-poly. Okay? So another way of saying this is, can all problems with exponentially long solutions, verifiable in exponential time, can they be solved with polynomial size circuit families? So if I, uh, am I allowed to lay out a separate circuit for each input length I could take any amount of time I wanted to lay out each circuit for each input link. It's just, does it exist or not? Um, again, it seems here, so, you know, NP is polynomial length solutions, verifiable polynomial time. Here, even the solution that we want to find uh, is exponentially long. The search space is doubly exponentially uh, big, and yet we still can't rule out uh, that polynomial size circuits could just solve the problem. Okay. Um, so uh, another way of thinking about this is just another perspective is given infinite preprocessing time. So I so I, I put no bound on like how long it might take you to find these magical polynomial size circuits for each input link. Can you then construct uh, small computation solving NX problems? Okay. Um, so this is the kind of question that's asked in circuit for algorithms. These kind of questions which seem seem obviously to have no answers, but yet it, it's, it seems really hard to actually get a handle on how you might prove that, how you might rule this kind of thing out. Okay. So uh, it's conjectured, for example, so we don't know if NX is contained in p-poly, non deterministic exponential time. It's conjectured that NP is not in p-poly. This would be a strengthening of p different from np. 
Okay, so we don't expect it to be proved. Uh, assuming we even in X minus P poly uh, seems pretty hard at the moment. But in other words, we think that the SAT problem cannot be in P slash poly. Um, like it just seems that if you wanted to solve like the SAT problem, let's say on a instances of length a million, there's no there's not going to be some efficient chip design, you know, even maybe hard to obtain, but there's not going to be any efficient chip design, logic design you could lay out, and you know somehow some some polynomial in a million uh, be able to solve SAT with it. Okay, so proving things like NP not in P poly would be a first step to getting concrete numerical trade-offs between the sizes of inputs in the computation and the sizes of the computation themselves. Okay, so like suppose you wanted to prove that you know, within uh, the known universe we cannot construct a computer that will solve SAT on instances of length, all instances of length a million. Okay, uh, so this, you can think of NP, on NP poly as an asymptotic version of this kind of statement, trying to prove that kind of thing. And indeed, uh, in the past, uh, Meyer and Stockmeyer used a very strong circuit lower bound for a problem in exponential space and used it to just a simple logic problem in exponential space and showed that any circuit that solved this problem on instances of, let's say, length at most 700 bits, okay, it would acquire a computer larger than 10 to the 80, okay, gates, okay? So we can sort of safely assume that, that we, we're not going to have uh, a chip that will, that will solve this logic problem, okay? Um, so you can imagine trying to prove this kind of thing for problems we really care about, like integer factorization. I mean, if, or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe there are small circuits for integer factorization. But this is, uh, one of the chief motivations for looking at circuit complexity in this way, okay, for looking at, at, at P slash poly. You could prove be different from NP and be nowhere near proving a result of, of this kind, I was saying, like a concrete numerical result that you can't solve SAT on instances of length a million in the known universe. Okay. Would you, but depending on how you prove this, you could potentially uh, have that as a corollary. So uh, even though we think that exp is not NP poly and exp is not NP poly, I would like to at least say that there, there were famous mathematicians that thought perhaps the opposite was true. Okay. So uh, Kolmogorov actually hypothesized that uh, polynomial time has linear size circuits. Okay. You can think of this as like a very scaled down version of saying you know, exp, exponential time has smaller than exponential size circuits. Okay, so, so in other words, every problem in P, even if it took into the hundred time, into the million time to solve, he, he believed, well, perhaps there's a linear size circuit family. So for any, yes? And it literally does imply that X has two to the delta N circuits for every curve. Yes, it does, by padding, yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's even stronger than that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So this would be remarkable, not only for the reason Russell pointed out, but in fact, uh, a proof of P not equal NP would just follow immediately from, from proving this kind of circuit upper bound. You would get uh, P different from NP. And um, so the, the main reason was more or less sketched in, in Russell's talk, okay? So from Russell's talk, we can say that there is a language in uh, the third level of polynomial hierarchy, sigma 3P, um, such that uh, L does not have circuits of even n squared size. Okay? Okay? And this is essentially by guessing a function which doesn't have such circuits, okay? Then universally verifying using maybe another existential quantifier to check that it actually doesn't. Okay? Guessing the lexicographically first function on, let's say, n cubed bits that doesn't have n squared size circuits, and then verifying that our guess is correct. Okay, by just go, by trying all possible circuits in a universal quantifier, then checking it's the first one using the existential quantifier, the other existential. Okay, 
But if, so this is just a fact, and this follows uh, from Conan. Now, if p equals np, hmm. if p equals np, then uh, sigma 3 p would equal p. And so we would have a language in p that doesn't have, say, n squared size circuits. OK? So if, if p equals np, then p does not have, say, n squared size circuits. Definitely doesn't have linear size circuits either. OK? All right? So, um, so this is a very intriguing thing. You might wonder, why, why on earth would he conjecture this? I mean, he was a very famous, very smart mathematician. Surely he had some reason. Well, he did. Um, so, oops. Sorry, my computer is like being so, um, so in the course of resolving Hilbert's uh, 13 problem with VI, Arnold, Kolmogorov showed the following. He showed that any invariable continuous function can be actually written as an arithmetic circuit of a certain kind, okay, where the gates are just the summation of two things. So it's like the one gate is just a sum of fan and two. Let me just write something here. So like one gate is just going to sum its two inputs and produce an output. And another one is just going to compute an arbitrary one variable continuous function. Okay, so we just, you know, given an x outputs an f of x. Given x and y, x plus y. Okay, so they actually showed that um, any n-variate continuous function okay. can be written as, let's say, order n squared, uh, as a circuit with order n squared gates of this form. Okay, so you have some circuit that's got n inputs on it, okay, and it's got these sums, and it's got these you, like one variant uh, continuous functions, and somehow it computes the whole invariant continuous function. Okay. It's a very, very non-trivial, very, very interesting result. And so when he first heard of Boolean circumplexity, he thought, why not? <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, well, okay, the, 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 the gates of fan and two that we have are and, or, you know, XOR. But, uh, yeah, maybe, the, maybe there is something to this. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show that there is like a counterintuition to, to all these circuit lower bounds. Okay, yeah. What did he do with his hypothesis? So, like, did he prove anything assuming it was true? Uh, he, I don't think he did. Others did. Later, yeah. Uh, for example, Dick Lipton has a whole paper about if P has linear size circuits, the following interesting world happens. Oh, P. It was for P. Lipton's paper in CCC 1994 on uh, assuming P has linear size circuits, all these. And, and there's been follow up work. So, so we kind of understand the world where this hypothesis is true, but we don't know how to show this world is contradictory at all. Like, it's, it seems to totally self-consistent, and it's just, OK, <laughs> maybe it. Okay. Any more uh, questions? OK, so one thing I want to point out, and what I'm going to say here is kind of recapping some of what Russell said, but it's worth repeating is that these questions have interesting consequences no matter how you end up resolving them. Maybe you end up showing x plus small circuits, maybe you show they don't. Either way, you get, you get something interesting. So as uh, Russell mentioned, if x is np poly, then p is not equal np. Or maybe you said the contrapositive. Uh, I just said that then x equals sigma 2. It does follow the views from np just Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, from, yeah. Yeah, from that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, so okay, so if x is np poly, then p is different from np, and it, it follows roughly the same kind of argument. So, and in fact, you can say the stronger uh, folklore theorem. Uh, in fact, I don't know this folklore theorem may be due to Valentin for a yeah. uh, <laughs> so, It's okay, Valentin's folklore theorem. <laughs> so, if every problem into the order n time 
has circuits smaller than, say, even 1.99 to the n size. Okay, just you know, just some slight improvement over two to the n. Okay, for infinitely many input links, then then p is different from np. Okay, and it follows the same sort of of argument because you can construct functions not in to the order n time deterministically, but if you add some quantifiers, you work in like sigma three to the order n time. You can construct circuits that do not have. So you can construct functions that do not have circuits smaller than this. Okay, and, but then if p equal to np, um, you know that it would contradict. Would contradict this. So it, I mean, that would mean that everything in sigma three to the order n time can be solved deterministically in to the order n time. Okay. In fact, they point out it doesn't even have to be 1.99. It could just be max, like something smaller than the maximum, one off by the maximum circuit complexity, I guess. Right? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure who first proved it, but are 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 you are you really the are you really the I first know person? I don't. I don't. Now that I have you here, I mean. So, okay. On the other hand, suppose uh, suppose okay, maybe X doesn't have polynomial size circuits. Then you get pseudorandom generators. Okay. Um, so, for example, a theorem by Russell and Avi says that if some problem into the order n time needs circuits larger than 1.99 in size for almost all input links. So I just basically wrote the negation here very carefully. Then p equals bbp. Okay. So either way, you know, upper bounds or lower bounds, you get you get some extremely interesting results in complexity theory. Okay. And in fact, even proving uh, n x is not in p poly, you can get some kind of elimination of randomness. You can get some kind of de-randomization, but not necessarily for randomized computations by themselves, but for Merlin Arthur. So this is problems uh, that can be verified using randomness. Okay, so it's, a, it's like the randomized version of NP, where Merlin gives some proof. It's like you make a guess, and Arthur tosses some coins and then verifies Merlin's proof. Okay. So you can simulate Merlin and Arthur non-trivially, non-deterministically. Okay, so you can remove the randomness at a cost of some sub-exponential running time. And I, I, I guess you're going to talk about this maybe tomorrow or the next day. Eventually, right? Because easy witness sort of uses this. Yeah. 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 Okay. So if you see his easy witness talk, this will make more sense. The point is, even proving this weak, weak-looking. Circuit lower bound already gets you some non-trivial de-randomization. Okay, it already says you can remove randomness in some way. Okay. Okay. Any any questions about these things? Uh, so, Fortner theorem is infinitely many, and IW is almost all. Yeah, yeah. So if you had infinitely many here, then you would have BBP infinitely often in P. Okay. But there is an analog of infinitely many for IW as well. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, so if you had infinitely many here, you would have BBP infinitely, for infinitely many input links, BBP computations can be simulated in P. Yeah. But this circuit lower bound for like sigma 3 to the order n time, that holds for, for every input link, for almost every input link. So this is why you can say even infinitely many input links implies P different than P. Anymore? So, um, yeah. I'm kind of playing both sides of the field here, but like, uh, but most people believe that um, kind of the bottom two there that uh, we these believe. two. Yes, 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 yes. Most people believe that, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's my. Uh, 30-minute brief summary of uh, circuit complexity. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So here, the infinitely many and almost all are important, right? Otherwise, you'd get P equals BBP somehow? Well, you get what? Sorry. So if you prove the statements for, for all input lengths. Prove this statement for all input lengths. And folklore theorem for all input lengths. No, th that would be weaker. So if every problem is circuit smaller than that, for all input lengths, that would also imply this. Because that's a stronger hypothesis. Then you get P equals BBP. Right. 
as stated. If you get it for inflame many input links, then BBB, then for every. I see where you're going, but if you try to do a win win argument, all you get is that if P equals NP, then P equals BBB. I see. So I carefully you know, yeah, set it up so that these are like absolute negations of each other, but I encourage you to, yeah. <laughs> Keep thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Do you have a question or something? Do you have a? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm just wondering. Like, is, is there any hope of, of saying like trying to do a counting argument to say that there's just too many functions in in exp for it to be solved by polynomial size circuits? Oh, could you possibly use a counting argument? Well. The thing is, the number of languages in, in X, you know, is a sort of, you know, it's kind of, rec it's recursive. Like, the, you can list them all. There's a non-deterministic exponential time machine, you know, sort of corresponding to each one of them. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, what a counting argument would look like, but, I mean, it's, is it, are you saying, like, maybe you could, you could some, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, how you would use the structure of NX in a counting argument, but. It's a, why not? I mean, try it. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yes. I don't know why did you get a number 1.99? Oh, uh, okay. I chose 1.99 so that this statement would be true. So, so in order for them to reach their conclusion, they would like to have 2 to the delta n for some delta less than 1. Right. So yeah. 1.99 is arbitrary there. Yeah, yeah. This, the sort of, Yes, yeah, so arbitrary constant that I sort of put close to two, so, so, but so greater so than one, less than two. Yeah. yeah. So putting the number so that they match, but you can so increase the number on the first one and decrease the number on the second one. Yeah. And it's still true. That's true. Yeah, you could decrease the number on this one and increase the number on this one, and these implications still hold, but they no longer look as nice because they no longer exact negates to each other. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, is that oh, okay. okay. Good. Okay. So, uh, so that's what I wanted to say, at least to uh, refresh uh, your memory or introduce you to circuit complexity. Now I want to, to speak a bit about connections. Okay. So we have these two areas that we've been talking about. One is algorithms for circuits or the circuit analysis algorithms or as some like to call it meta algorithms. Um, so this is just the task of designing faster circuit analysis. You give me some circuit or you give me some Boolean function, tell me something about the circuit complexity. Okay? I mean even SAT can be seen as something like tell me something about the circuit complexity. Is it a trivial function or not? Does it have non-trivial circuit complexity? SAT can be seen in this way as well. Okay. So the circuit for algorithms problem, or circuit complexity, as I have stated it here, is we would like to design small circuits to simulate complicated algorithms, like exponential time algorithms, or non-deterministic exponential time algorithms, or prove that small circuits don't exist in some form or another. So can we use one of these tasks to inform the other? Um, so the most intriguing sort of connection would be things like, can we use algorithm design here, like sort of faster SAT algorithms, faster CAP algorithms, stuff like that, to tell us something about the limitations of circuits. Okay. And so th to me this is sort of the more interesting direction because the conventional wisdom is that algorithm design is something we can wrap our heads around, something very easy, but thinking about all possible circuits and what everything they could possibly do seems hard. Okay. I mean, there are Connections in the opposite direction, as Russell's lectures will tell you a lot about. I'll talk a bit about them too. But I, I really like these connections because it's sort of like the best kind of computer science arbitrage opportunity. You know, like we have lots and lots of algorithm design techniques. We have very few lower bounds. So, you know, if you can really, you know, take things here and push them there, then you know maybe you could, you know, tip the balance in, uh, a bit more. Okay, get more lower bounds. Okay. All right, so um, just to get started, so this theorem of uh, Karp, Lipter, and Meyer that Russell mentioned can be seen in the following light. 
Suppose we had extremely efficient circuit analysis algorithms. Okay. Suppose P equals NP. So we can solve things like uh, uh, circuit SAT in polynomial time. We can solve circuit minimization in polynomial time. Great. Okay. So then we could prove that there are problems solvable in 2 to the n time that are not in P slash poly. Okay. In other words, if P equals NP, you have sort of perfect circuit analysis algorithms then you can find functions in exponential time that can't be in p poly. They don't have an infinite family of poly size circuits. Right. So this is just you know, another way of, of restating the thing. It's just trying to fit it into this uh, question of circuit analysis versus circuit lower bounds. Okay. Now this is a very interesting conditional statement. But of course, like, it's of limited utility if you actually want to prove circuit lower bounds because we don't believe the hypothesis. Okay? So one uh, big goal in this area is to find hypotheses much, much weaker than P equals NP, for which you can still conclude circuit lower bounds from those hypotheses. Okay? And we'll see several examples of that. Right. So another uh, place where circuit analysis algorithms inform circuit limit is in this minimum circuit size problem studied by Valentin and Jin Sai. So they studied many consequences of this thing. Just to remind you, MCSP, uh, in this problem we're given the truth table of a Boolean function. So we're given 2 to the n bits, okay, just the entire uh, table of the function. And a parameter s, we want to know if that function is a circuit of size at most s. Okay. So you know, given this function just laid out completely for you, is there, a way, like, is there a way to compress the representation of this function to something at most s? Okay. There's another way of thinking about it. Okay. So they show that if this problem were in polynomial time, you could get quite a few interesting consequences. For one, um, this class exponential time with an NP oracle. So I haven't said anything about it yet, but let me at least, you know, uh, in the spirit of Russell, draw some diagrams or something. Um, so there's all these different classes flying around, so I feel obligated to just draw some little kind of picture here. So x to the np, and x was contained in that, x contained in that, p space. OK, we have uh, uh, like sigma kps. OK, and we have sigma 2p, you know, things like Merlin and Arthur. OK, all right. Uh, OK, so x to the np would, would slightly bigger than nx. It's like you get to ask exponentially long queries to an np oracle. Okay, so you get to sort of uh, solve nx problems some exponential number of times. Okay, This class would require maximum circuit complexity. Now, as far as I know, the best upper bound for a function of maximum circuit complexity, it's not even, it's not even like sigma 2x, but it's more like sigma 3x, but I'd be happy if I, if somebody could, is it there? I, I don't know of like the construction of a function like, uh, like smaller than sigma 3x that requires maximum circuit complexity. Yeah. So in the spirit of Russell, like if MCSP is in P, then the shell falls down and, and you get a function here, x to the NP. At least for that particular language, not the whole shelf, just a heavy, heavy book on the shelf, yeah. not the whole shelf, because a heavy book falls to x to the NP. And so uh, there's some language here which can be implemented here, which has maximum circumplexity. You know, by maximum, I mean like essentially 2 to the n over n, exactly. Whatever the hardest, whatever like that number is for the hardest. Uh, the largest circuit size of an n-bit Boolean function, there's a language in XMP is going to have it. A particular language is going to have it for every input length. Okay. So this would be new circuit lower bounds. Okay. You would also get uh, a collapse of two different kinds of randomized computation. So ZPP is zero error randomized computation, as you recall, and BBB is the two-sided version. Essentially, like this is a, often called the Las Vegas class of algorithms, where you never uh, make a mistake, you just output don't know in, in some cases. And here you could, you could err in the yes case and in the no case. And these two things would collapse if uh, you had a polytime algorithm like this. Okay. 
And, uh, and as I briefly mentioned, Last time, a lot of different problems for which uh, cryptography is based on like discrete log, factoring, even graph isomorphism, they would all be in BPP if MCSP or even in randomized polynomial time. That would be true. Okay. But also, you would have something very unlikely. Okay, you would have that there are no strong pseudorandom functions. There are strong, very strong pseudorandom generators. Okay. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. Okay. So um, we can also think of the, the natural proof barrier of Rasborov and Rudich as being a connection of this kind, where circuit analysis algorithms imply something about limitations of circuits. Okay. So just to say at a very high level what I mean, suppose while proving a circuit lower bound, okay, in the course of doing it, you not only prove that some function doesn't have small circuits, you actually construct a polynomial time algorithm. Okay? This polynomial time algorithm, can ta it takes truth tables of functions as input. Okay? It can do sort of two key things. It can distinguish many functions, so random functions, say, that are not computable with these circuits, whatever circuit around you're proving. You can distinguish many functions not computable from all the easy functions that are computable with the circuits. Okay? So not only did you prove that a particular function doesn't have some small circuits, you developed an algorithm that took, takes arbitrary truth tables. It can say for many, many functions, it will say yes, these aren't computable. For all the easy functions that are computable, it will say no. Okay, so we can do this very nice distinguishing thing. Okay. Okay. If you can do that, if you do that in your circuit lower bound, so the way you're thinking about this is that MCSP is kind of NP, is what this is sort of saying. So MCSP is saying, give me a truth table, what's its circuit complexity? Here I want to, a polynomial time algorithm, given a truth table, will say on many functions the right answer. It will say, yes, these don't have small circuits. And for all the easy functions that are computable, it will say the right answer. Okay, so this sort of, this is, you can think of this as MCSP is kind of NP. Okay, if you can do that, then those circuits, whatever you prove the circuit lower bound against, they're too weak to support pseudorandom functions. Okay. So this is, you can easily think of this as a circuit analysis algorithm you know, on the polynomial time algorithm manipulating uh, truth tables in these circuits that shows that these circuits are too weak to do something. Okay. But the punchline here is not that we get you know, a circuit lower bound because we believe pseudorandom functions exist. So we think that the polynomial time algorithms should not exist. Okay. So we, we sort of draw a different moral from this kind of connection. Okay? So uh, we believe that, in fact, very low depth circuits, like say out of majority gates, can support pseudorandom functions. And so there shouldn't be polynomial time algorithms that can distinguish many functions computable with those circuits from all the easy ones. Okay. In other words, if we believe it's possible to prove lower bounds that are strong enough to support cryptography, then we should also believe that these natural proofs, so Net proofs which construct these polynomial time algorithms are not going to be able to prove things like PDF or MIMPI. Okay? Um, okay. So, but unfortunately, most of the arguments for strong circuit lower bounds actually do have a polynomial time algorithm embedded in them, or they can be extracted from the proof in some way or another. So that's sort of the remarkable uh, thing about the natural proofs barrier is that uh, circuit, many circuit lower bounds actually are proved in this way, maybe implicitly in some cases, in, in which case they're just too weak to prove strong enough lower bounds. Okay. Uh, yeah. So would you say if we believe it's possible to prove lower bounds which are strong enough to support crypto? Yeah, like, in other words, okay, okay. yeah, things like that, yeah. If we prove lower bounds strong enough to like, create cryptographic PRGs? Or, yeah, if we believe in the, if we believe like lower bounds like we would believe that cryptography is possible in a certain sense, okay, then there must be certain lower bounds, okay? And then natural proofs will not be able to, ex just to give you even you know, weaker lower bounds because they would rule out the cryptography in the process. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the usual way, I mean, just to match this up with maybe the way you, have, you may have seen the natural proofs barrier before, if you have, is that it would be nice if I could draw on my computer, but uh, I'm not going to draw. <laughs> so, what if I? 
Oh, just just for the moment, okay. Don't get. Uh, I guess the people at home are just going to miss out. So like, okay. So the polytime algorithm is often called constructive, being constructive, and uh, distinguishing many functions not computable. This is often called the largeness property. And from all these easy functions that are computable, this is being useful. Okay. The whole purpose of a lower bound is to show that all the easy functions can be computed some way or another by your function. Okay, so usually the way you look at uh, what is it actually? Okay. Sorry. So, um, so, so the usual way you would say these things in natural proofs terminology is that you have some property of Boolean functions that's constructive. You have a polytime algorithm. It's large. It's many functions and useful. Okay. All right. Just to match it up with your intuition if you've seen these things before. Okay? All right. So I, I did want to say a bit about uh, arithmetic complexity. Um, I don't know to what extent Russell's going to speak about it, but it should certainly be mentioned one way or another. What's that? Friday is the whole. Okay, so this is like a warm up to Russell's talk. Okay, sort of like a pre prep. So, so uh, this deals with a different model. Okay, it's not the usual circuit model of and, or, and dots. It, we deal with arithmetic formulae. So, so our operations are like plus and times. Let's say with the integers instead of or and and. Okay. And so the, the rough analog of the SAT problem in arithmetic formulae is polynomial identity testing. So given two arithmetic formulas, f and g, do they represent the same polynomial? Okay, and by, by that I mean literally their coefficients match up exactly in every single term. Okay, so it's just checking. So they might be written in different ways, right? You can write polynomials in all kinds of different ways. You just want to know, you know, if it's written in way f and way g, are they actually the same polynomial? If you expand the whole thing out and looked at the sum of products. So here are some examples, uh, like Euler made a living off these kinds of things. So you know. Uh, well, this one's easy. Maybe this one, okay, not so easy. So, but, like, this is a f and a g, and you know, you can sort of concoct all sorts of left-hand sides and right-hand sides, which you know happen to match up in all the coefficients. But knowing when this is the case and when it's not, um, you know, it seems it could be difficult to do. Okay, but there are efficient randomized algorithms for polynomial identity testing. Okay, and the the main idea behind those is you just pick sufficiently large random values. You plug in for all the variables on both sides. Okay? Just sufficiently large random values and a sufficiently large set. Just plug them all in and just check if the, when you simplify, when you, when you simplify the left-hand side and right-hand side, do they, are they equal or not? Okay? This turns out to be extremely effective randomized algorithm, but no efficient deterministic algorithms are known. There's no way to sort of concoct uh, you know, a really small, nice set of points you could just plug in no matter what, and get it to work. Okay? Um, or just maybe doing something totally different, like uh, in, you know, doing some interesting interpolation on both left and right hand side somehow. Okay? So it's a big, big open problem to find you know, even sub exponential determinist time deterministic algorithms for this one. Okay? So, uh, a, a really, really influential uh, theorem of Valentin and Russell from 2004 uh, is a connection between uh, circuit analysis algorithms for polynomial identity testing, in this case, for arithmetic formulas, and formula lower bounds. So, they show that sub exponential time algorithms for polynomial identity testing on formulas will get you formula size lower bounds. On circuits, you get circuit lower bounds. There is a nice correspondence between these things. So somehow understanding uh, polynomials as formulas say well enough to know when two of them are the same gives you enough leverage to actually prove a limitation on what they can express as polynomials. Okay. So more formally, they show that either an x is not in p-poly or the permanent does not have arithmetic formulas of polynomial size. This, this result has since been sharpened, the consequence. So what, can you just... Uh, Tell me what the new consequence is. 
like just recently, very recently, the consequence of sharpen. Um, so, um, maybe Marco. Okay. Multilinear interpol the multilinear interpolation of nx intersect co nx problems are not. So, is it, don't so if I write something like this. Uh, yeah. Is or like some twiddle. There's a thing that this is like some twiddle yeah. <laughs> of this. Does not have algebraic polynomial side circuits. That is a consequence of efficient Okay. Something like an X intersect co an X. So it's so it's sort of been improved the consequence of Okay. Just say this. Sorry? Oh, uh, even even sub-exponential. Do you sub-exponential is enough to get your consequence too? Yeah. So like two to the n to the little o of one, where n is the size of the expression. So two to the n to the little o of one, or two to the n to the epsilon for every epsilon. I think I don't think you need something computable. Uh, you, oh, you do. Oh, you do. But you didn't hear, right? Not here. Okay. Not here, but, uh, well, All right. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, something, something good, something much, much better than what we know, much better than two to the n or, or whatever. Okay, so efficient algorithms for analyzing arithmetic formulas imply limitations on representing explicit polynomials with small formulas. Okay. Again, the same uh, kind of lesson that we were talking about with these things, like if p equals np, then you get circuit lower bounds. Any question about the statement of the thing? Russell will talk about more detail later. And this is just a branch of what Russell was talking about earlier about de-randomization implying lower bounds. Uh, yeah, 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 because this is a, yes, because this is a problem solvable efficiently with randomness. Yeah, this is sort of a special problem, de-randomizing this problem. This is a problem-centric, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, de yeah. Everything is about arithmetical formulae. Yeah, well, you can you can phrase it in terms of circuits. I like formulae because I can sort of write them on the slide easy. That was that was essentially. I earlier looked at formulae, so you know that, that was it. That was you can you can say everything in terms of circuits. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so uh, there's a connection that's been recently developed, um, and connections are sort of still ongoing. Where in the Boolean setting, you can show that slightly faster algorithms for C set. Again, recall that like C set was you could in this place of C you could put C and F, you could put formulas, you could put circuits, arbitrary circuits. Um, so in general, you can show that slightly faster algorithms and exhaustive search for C set imply lower bounds against that class of circuits C. Okay. So just in pictures, suppose you know this is an example circuit from my class C. Suppose inspecting this circuit, I can find an assignment which makes the circuit print one, or conclude there's no such assignment. And I can do this not in two to the n times n to the c time, which would be the naive thing, but I can do it in, let's say, two to the n over n to the 10 time. Okay. And let's say I can do this for all constants c, no matter what the constant little c is. Here in the size, maybe the, you know, there's some dependence in the big O on the c. I can get to the n over n to 10. Okay? So this is a very, very minor improvement over exhaustive search. Nothing like 1.9 to the n. You know, nothing like even to the n minus n to the epsilon. This is to the n over a polynomial, a fixed polynomial. Again, this 10 is just chosen to be sufficiently large. You could make it maybe 4 or 3, depending. It actually begins to depend on the computational model you're looking at uh, if, you, if you bring this constant down far enough. So if you can do that, if you can solve circuits at even slightly faster than exhaustive search like that, then for the same class of circuits, you can conclude there is a function in non-deterministic exponential time that does not have poly-sized circuits. Okay. So if this were a C circuit class, then this would be NX would not have poly-sized C circuits here. Okay. But if it's an arbitrary circuit class, if you're solving circuits at, uh, on arbitrary circuits, you get NX not in P poly. Okay. Uh, and so this looks really nice. I mean, I mean, for one, people had not really 
looked at getting this kind of minor improvement over exhaustive search before, mainly uh, people would just focus on, you know, if you have a C to the N algorithm, I would like something like C minus epsilon to the N, you know, like a 1.9 to the N time algorithm. But this is showing that, like, you know, even tiny improvements will get you already some, some significant lower bounds. Okay? In terms of circuits. Yeah, I mean, maybe this, you know, makes sense just because NX is such a big class, you know, maybe you don't have to understand circuits so well to, to separate NX from B poly, just understand them well enough to get something slightly faster into the end. Okay? So this is a, a fairly uh, broad kind of theorem in the sense that if you have, say, a faster circuit set algorithm, you get NX on P poly. If you have formula set, you know, faster run for formula set, you get uh, lower bounds for formulas. Uh, in, in other words, NX is not a non-uniform in C1. Basically, NX does not have um, an infinite sequence of polynomial sized formulas that work for you know, every input length. Okay? And for this class ACC, we talked about last time, solving it faster than to the n actually imply NX not in ACC. Okay? We, we showed, uh, at least briefly outlined, how you could uh, you know, get such an algorithm last time. Okay? So we get a lower bound for this ACC thing. But um, another thing that's important to, to mention and uh, could be very useful in the hunt for lower bound proofs is that you don't have to solve the SAT problem. Okay? You, don't have to, you don't have to solve like, the full SAT problem. You, you actually just have to de-randomize the problem we think is in polynomial time. Okay? So the, the problem is the following. Given a circuit C that's either completely unsatisfiable or at least half its assignments are satisfying. Okay. But you don't know which ones. You, know, you, just, you just promise that it's either totally unsatisfiable or half its assignments are satisfying. You just want to know which is the case. And you don't get to use randomness. You, you have to somehow deterministically figure out which of these two is the case. Again, into the n over n 10 time. Okay. Now again, this, because we believe uh, BPP is equal to P, we believe this problem is solvable in polynomial time deterministically. We just want to beat that. Okay, we just want to beat exhaustive search. Okay. Again, you would get NX is not MP poly. And, se and since uh, the original paper, it's been shown, like in work with Raul Santana, that this uh, kind of connection between circuits, you know, just distinguishing between unsat and sat ev almost everywhere, uh, getting lower bounds, this connection also holds even for really low circuit classes like. Uh, TC0, so constant depth majority gates, like having some algorithm which solves this very, very basic de-randomization problem will get you lower bounds against TC0 circuits. Okay? Can you also get size improvements? So if you had a good algorithm for nearly exponential size circuits, can you get that NX is not inside the exponential size circuit? Um, so you, so there, you can get, there is a trade-off up to some point. Um, but getting like truly exponential lower bounds is going to be hard because there's this easy witness lemma thing that goes on in this proof, which is going to reduce the size of the lower bound you're going to get. But if you go up to x to the mp from nx, then you can, you can start to prove things like that. Given a set algorithm for exponential size circuits, you can get exponential size lower bounds for x. Oops. Wait, what, what is going on? Do I have like a phantom clicker? What is going on? Right. <laughs> this thing's been a ghost in the machines. Wait, so where was I? Okay, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, this looks like a good place to stop, actually. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's like a hair on my trackpad. I think that's all. There's a hair on my trackpad, and I should just go over them while the ghost is running. Uh, wow. Okay. This is. Let's see. Is there any way to stop? I can just keep holding this down or something. Uh, hmm. Okay. It kind of stopped. 
No, it didn't stop. So, okay, there are many well-known connections between the circular bones. So, uh, Russell's going to cover this. Uh, for a restricted circuit, sometimes the techniques used, you're going too fast, man. What, what's, what's going on? You're going too fast. You're going, you got to slow down. You got to slow down. Maybe I should restart the PowerPoint. Can we just time for break? I think I'm almost done, yeah. I think it's a good time to stop. Um, so how about I conclude? Yeah. <laughs> Since we didn't have a chairman, the machine actually took over. Yeah, he, he was like, you know what? Finish your talk. Finish your talk now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, automatic chair. Yeah. Yeah. So what you wanted to say before the computer crashed? I, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? You know, uh, no, but what, what were the missing slides? Oh, no, no, I'm, you're going to see them next time. No, no, I, like this is a two lecture lecture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I will just pick up from there next time. You're not going to miss a thing. Yeah, yeah. So this is circuit complexity and connections one. Tomorrow you'll get circuit and complexity connections two. Yeah, yeah, no worries. You won't miss a thing. Yeah. yeah. I know you think the other direction, you mentioned that the other direction is less interesting, but in the setting of SAT algorithms, um, what what do we have from sort oh, of generic lower bounds? Instead by of, direction you mean? Instead of, like using, instead of using lower bound proofs to get these algorithms, which we know we can do, yeah. if you just assume a lower bound in kind of a black box way, can you do anything? I mean, I wasn't trying to diss, you know, people who work in the opposite direction. Uh, so. It's a very interesting question whether circuit lower bounds could imply circuit set algorithms. Um, yeah, that that seems that seems uh, like a really interesting question. It may not be possible to to prove it, for all I know, um, in a black box way. So it's known that, like, right, if you open up the proofs of circuit lower bounds, you look at random restriction methods, you look at shrinkage stuff like this. Yes, you can get algorithms out of that. There's entire papers written on this, uh, which I was quoting like as my slides were flying through. But okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think this is a very interesting question. So from SAT algorithms, we know how to get lower bounds going the opposite direction. Even like, even if you need like lots of technical conditions to make that direction work, it would still be very, very interesting. Absolutely. More questions? Let's thank Ryan again. Thank you.